everybody and welcome to the mental revolutions we're going to talk about how the world flipped, turned upside down in the 16th through 18th centuries uh, we're going to talk about the scientific revolution and the enlightenment which are actually two separate uh, phenomena that kind of coexist a little bit they have a lot in common uh, they draw from each other and uh, they change the way that humans perceive and interact with the wider world before we do though let's go ahead and do a quick review uh, from the catch-up that we did last week now, Western Europeans in general, uh, mostly Portugal and Spain, but also to a lesser degree, uh, France, England, uh, and the Netherlands, explore mostly out of necessity the, the desire to trade for important resources, but also partly out of curiosity. We talked about uh, Prince Henry the Navigator last week, who was an aficionado of maps and exploration and finding new lands, uh, happened to coincide with the natural human um, impulse to commerce, uh, in other words, trading goods uh, that has existed since time immemorial. Uh, and it's important to differentiate commerce from other type of economic theories and economic structures that will come down later. Okay. Now, this direct contact with places like uh, China, Japan, North or South uh, America, uh, they allow for exploitation, uh, absolutely, of resources. They allow for um, conflict. They allow for trade. And of course, they allow for the spread of disease. And as we touched on very, very briefly, last week we'll get more into it in later weeks uh the exponential growth of uh enslavement and the use of coerced human labor why why do these things happen well particularly in the course of exploitation and enslavement uh, it's because in this pre-mechanical uh pre-industrial revolution time labor-intensive efforts uh, to pull resources out of the earth, whether it be through a mine or cutting timber or through plantations. These are all extremely labor-intensive. I touched on this a little bit last week, and I don't think you quite can grasp the scale and magnitude of the back porch for lack of a better term of versailles all of that was done without tools without well without mechanical tools without uh, explosives this was done by purely muscle power alone imagine you have to pick up your axe and go clear several acres worth of land it will take you a very 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 long time well same thing is true when you're trying to set up a plantation for example for cotton or for tobacco or for sugarcane you have to clear there were a lot of forests that were cleared a lot of uh, islands were denuded of their trees in order to make way for uh, money crops like uh, tobacco or sugarcane or whatever uh, and that is very labor intensive on top of that the growing the weeding the care and maintenance the processing of all of these products are very very labor intensive so they take a lot of man hours so they need a lot of people in order to make it profitable and the more profitable it can be made is if you can cut back on labor costs a a truism that exists all the way to today it, lots of times when businesses need to restructure uh, they will lay off people so that's because people are expensive paying people is expensive so in general though uh, when we are talking about the early periods of exploration from the 15th century to about the 17th century, Europeans in general, as a whole, as a continent, are typically less wealthy and less powerful than their Asian and Middle Eastern counterparts. This is absolutely true when it comes to the case of China, uh, true when it comes to the case of India or the Ottoman Empire or the Safavid Empire or it, these empires are extremely wealthy they're extremely powerful much more powerful than any european nation 
not more powerful than Europeans as a whole, like if we put them all together, but rarely does that happen where Europeans work together. Often Europeans are busy competing against each other. That, however, doesn't stay true for a very long time. Uh, after a couple of centuries, Europeans find themselves uh, in control of vast sprawling empires, whether real physical empires such as the owning of land in the Western Hemisphere or vast trading empires in the case of the Dutch, for example, although they, they also do uh, take some land, but not nearly to the degree that the, the Spanish or later on the English will. Uh, but it's these vast trading empires, these sprawling empires that really drive the need for consolidation. Now, there's different types of consolidation. I've only touched upon one, and that is absolutism, absolutism and the power of kings. Now, do we remember what absolutism means? In your notes, you should have down from the slide that we have. Absolutism is the authority of a central figure without regard or input or influence by anybody else, whether it's a representative body, the body politic, tradition, religion, doesn't matter. The central authority lies with the king and it's a very circular kind of logic. Well, the king is all powerful because the king has said, I'm all powerful. There you are. So it's a very circular logic. And you can see that there's some real fallacies in there and there's some real problems with that system. It works for some societies, not so much for others. For example, I want you to look at your notes and I want you to review. According to the lecture last week, what society had the most effective consolidation of power under an absolutist monarch? I'm going to give you a second or two here. On your, uh, on your notes also, what other society or societies had some absolutist success? In other words, they had some consolidation of power in a central authority who could act with relative impunity, but were still checked by, say, social tradition or uh, by the weight of, of the way things used to be done, uh, tradition essentially, or by religious authorities. And then finally, I want you to review your notes and look and tell me what society had very little success in consolidating power under an absolutist monarchy uh, due to, say, strong representative bodies or social pressures or decentralized authority or maybe all of the above. All right, now it's time for the answers revealed. So what society was the most effective consolidation, consolidator of power under absolutist monarchs according to the lecture? Well, France. France is a really good example of that consolidation of power under a single authority. It came about thanks in large part to a professional managerial class that began to emerge in the 1600s. Uh, and that's Louis XIII, Louis the 14th, Louis the 15th, and Louis the 16th all have uh, to a surprising degree an amount of authority over not just everyday peasant life or merchant life, but also over nobility. And this is an important distinction because in the medieval period and all the way up to about the 1500s, there were small principalities or duchies or counties that were surprisingly powerful and surprisingly independent, especially in France. Uh, the consolidation of the authority was a concerted effort by uh, Cardinal Richelieu and his uh, and his successors, who were advisors to the king, who really kind of strengthened the grip of the monarch over this really large uh, country. And then, of course, later when we get overseas territories, that becomes uh, both a boon and a hindrance. So there's upsides and downsides to everything. So what other society had some absolute success was Russia. Russia has some hit and miss authoritarians. Uh, they have some absolutist monarchs in the form of Peter the Great and Catherine the Great, who are able to either manipulate or through sheer force of their personality, basically drag societies along and make them do what 
they what those monarchs wanted them to do. In between Peter the Great and Catherine the Great, who are not directly related, in between them you have some very kind of uh, weak czars, uh, weak emperors basically, who were beholden to special interests and then you have some that were relatively strong and 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 even after catherine the great you get that kind of oscillation some are very powerful some are not very powerful some are reformers some aren't very traditionalist that sort of thing so it's very hit and miss uh so you don't have that consistency the way you have in france all the way through uh to the to the uh, 19th century uh or late 18th century i should say uh, what society had very little absolute success, and that, of course, is England. England had uh, a very virulent reaction to attempts to consolidate uh, kingly authority, uh, particularly in Charles I. There's the the, uh, the English Civil War that happens in the 1600s. And then, of course, James I, after the restoration of the monarchy, he attempts to kind of bypass the authority of, of parliament, it leads to a quasi kind of second war, what is often referred to as the uh, the the great revolution uh this this uh nearly bloodless coup d'etat uh that allows a dutch king william of orange to come in and and basically rule england um as a representative monarchy a representative uh, or a constitutional monarchy rather uh the authority really in england lay with parliament parliament is the one who passes laws agrees to laws enforces laws parliament really has the power and that is true even today the the, the queen of england has very little real authority uh she can call parliament she can dismiss parliament there's a few other things that she can do but really is very very limited. The true executive in England is the prime minister, and the prime minister is the head of the, the largest coalition of uh, representatives in parliament. So it's not necessarily one party per se, although occasionally that does happen, uh, but usually a coalition of, of allied interests that make concessions to each other. So uh, England has a very little absolutist success, uh, and uh, it's a very... Um, a decentralized system, uh, but it still winds up working. So in summation, Europeans in general, if we're talking about from last last week, in general, Europeans through, across the board benefit from the exploitation of the Western Hemisphere, whether it's the new uh, luxuries that are coming in that increase the wealth, the overall wealth of Europeans in general, which increases the standard of living, increases uh, free time, the ability to be educated, that sort of thing, or it increases their nutritional content. Uh, we touched on potatoes last week. Potatoes are not the only one, but they are a very dramatic example of a, a uh, agricultural product that does profoundly change uh, the uh, health and well-being of Europeans across the spectrum. Another good example would be tomatoes. There's some other natural products that are in there, certain fruits and, and, and vegetables that come in like pumpkins. Uh, those those uh, also have an impact, but but the most profound impact is the potato. Uh, there's also a, a benefit from direct trade with India, China, and Japan. There's more and less expensive luxuries. Uh, so there's they were cutting out the middleman, as it were, by going directly to the source. It's kind of like an almost a, an infomercial or a, a cheap local commercial, if you will. Um, so this ben benefits most Europeans most of the time. Absolutely. Uh, standard of living rises across the 16th century into the 17th century and into the 18th century. Uh, the increased wealth leads to increased opportunity uh, thanks to new lands to be exploited, whether you're coming over as a colonist or you're coming over as an indentured servant or even a criminal or something like that. The, the, these do offer new opportunities that may not have been present in Europe to begin with. These new uh, lands also produce new luxuries, so uh, an influx of silver, for example, this flood of silver from the collapse of the Inca and the Aztec Empire forced upon it by the Spanish conquistadors, uh, the exploitation of silver mines and gem mines in the Western Hemisphere allows for an influx of new money, it also allows for 
some hyperinflation for Spain and to a lesser degree Portugal, which is not good for either of those and helps uh, kind of uh, force uh, the the empires to kind of crumble artificially. Uh, but there's new opportunities. There's new chances to start over, uh, new chances to own land to become your own kind of uh, a, a master of your own fate. You can become a new merchant. You become a successful sea captain, whatever. So we also have a consolidation and control that that increasingly becomes important as we move through the 16th and into the 17th and into the 18th centuries. The consolidation can take the form of absolutism. Absolutely, 100%. Absolutism uh, uh, is uh, very good at consolidating power uh, in itself, but to a lesser degree, also the other nations like uh, like uh, the the Re Dutch republics. Uh, again, a representative body, very rare in Europe, extremely rare in Europe. It's a kind of merchant princes who are in charge of, of things, you know, very powerful merchant interests who are in charge of things who consolidate power. And they have a much more uh, free and open economic system, which is kind of good for the Dutch, works out well for them. Uh, the English have a very consolidated power in parliament. Parliament becomes incredibly powerful. Uh, is able to influence the policies of kings and queens, is able to uh, to um, drum up national support and kind of a, a national loyalty, even though people may be displaced overseas by hundreds or even thousands of miles. So there is a consolidation and control, and that is important. So now we're moving on into the new lecture. We're going to talk about a couple of things, but but first I want to get some definitions out of the way right out of the gate. All right. So there are two different phases we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about the scientific revolution and we're going to talk about the enlightenment. Often these are talked about in the same breath as if they are the same thing. They are not. The scientific revolution is an inquiry into the natural world that uh, is based upon rigorous and repeatable experimentation as well as observations of the natural world. An excellent example of this is Darwin and the theory of evolution. Now, I must stop here and say what a theory is in science is different from a guess. A theory is the best model based upon evidence at hand. A for good example would be gravity or the, the solution for diseases. Based upon the best possible evidence that we have at hand, for example, if you have a problem with your heart, if you have heart disease, if you have clogged arteries, the best evidence that we have suggests if you eat less saturated food, if you exercise more, if you smoke less, if you drink alcohol less, if you eat leaner and more healthy foods, you'll get better. That's the prevailing theory. Now, does it 100% work all the time? No, for a variety of reasons, but the best working medical theory for curing, for example, uh, heart disease is to eat healthier, live healthier, exercise healthier. And it works for most people. So that's a theory. Does it mean that it's just a guess? No, based upon evidence. So there we have it. So scientific uh, revolution is based upon theories. Now, what happens when you have evidence that says, you know, A and B cause C? But then as you explore this theory, uh, say the physical world or any of its underlying rules, its structures or the principles that, that govern life in the universe, let's say for some reason, some of that evidence doesn't quite pan out. Does that mean your theory is incorrect? Well, not necessarily, not necessarily. It just means you have to change your theory a little bit as the evidence supports it. And that's the key, evidence, is the pathway to truth in the scientific revolution.
So things like uh, understanding gravity, understanding the spread of disease, understanding where life comes from, uh, understanding how physics works. These are all based upon theories that were then tested and then the theory was adjusted and it was tested again and then it was adjusted and tested again and continue and continue and continue and continue. There is no end point to knowledge. Knowledge like perfection is a road, not a destination. Anybody who says they absolutely know 100% something, uh, some deep underlying cosmic reality is probably either deluding themselves or lying to you. There's always room for improvement. And that's what the scientific revolution really gives us, is this idea that there's always room for improvement and there's ways to get at the truth, which leads us to the Enlightenment. The Enlightenment is an approach to understanding politics, human interactions. So politics, society, economics, so, uh, social pressures, poverty, uh, intolerance, you name it. So the Enlightenment really approaches uh, these with a similar set of rigorous standards that were given or inherited by uh, the scientific revolution. These inquiries seek to find the basis of morality beyond just what is written in scripture or written in texts, in, in, in holy texts. Um, trying to find the, the utmost of human potential. Can humans be better? How can humans be better? What methods can we use to improve human potential? Uh, can social structures be changed? Can you do it through reason and education, not through faith and hope, basically? So at the, the underlying principle of both the scientific revolution and the enlightenment are two sometimes complementary, sometimes competing uh, uh, methods of gathering evidence. The first is empiricism, or I'm sorry, empirism. Uh, empirism is, uh, I said it right the first time, empiricism, I'm sorry. Empiricism is that all knowledge is derived from your perception. For example, if you touch a rock and find out rocks are hard and they're cold and uh, they're rough, then you can extrapolate that, okay, so the reality is that this object, this rock, is harder than, say, a jellyfish or uh, softer than, say, a diamond. So your senses play a part in that. Rationalism is that all knowledge can be gained independent of your senses. There is some kind of underlying truth that can uh, speak to the um, speak to the the core of reality that doesn't rely upon your senses. For example, your senses can be deceived. You can think that something is three dimensional, but in reality, it's two dimensional. Or you can think something looks hard, but then when you actually test it, it's not hard. That rock crumbles when you try to when you try to crush it with your hand. Uh, something like that. There is an in a way to gain knowledge independent of our senses. So don't conflate the scientific revolution and the enlightenment. It's very easy to do. Scientific revolution deals with things like uh, astronomy, not astrology, astronomy, gravity, physics, medicine, navigation, you know, radiation, uh, that sort of thing. So scientific uh, pursuits, uh, scientific things that exist without humans. They don't need humans to exist. The Enlightenment deals with things that need humans to exist. For example, laws. Where do laws come from? Uh, religion. Where does religion come from? Do squirrels believe in Buddha? Do squir Do sparrows? Uh, are sparrows Sikhs? Are you know that sort of thing? They're not. So without humans religion doesn't exist. Without humans, laws, uh, at least you know, written laws, don't exist. Economics doesn't exist. Society doesn't exist. Politics doesn't exist. Does not happen, right? Only humans. So the Enlightenment deals with things that are human-centric. Scientific revolution deals with things that are universal. 
So let's talk about the scientific revolution, which happens between the 15th and the 18th century. And there's a little bit of overlap with the intellectual revolution. So the scientific revolution has these, these tensions uh, that are boundary pushing. And they're boundary pushing insofar as human interaction or human understanding of the world pushes against uh, these new discoveries, wants to rebel against the evidence that is made plain. So you have the old versus new, the, the tradition versus innovation. Uh, at the heart of this is uh, of, of the spread of the scientific revolution is really uh, kind of a European rivalry and competition, but also cooperation. There are people that uh, never meet each other, that live years and years apart, hundreds of miles apart, um, that read each other's works or that build upon those who came before and said, ah, kind of close, but I think I can do a little bit better. And they try to improve or they have this dialectic back and forth where they're constantly talking to each other. Uh, and the scientific revolution, like most human in endeavors, is not a linear progression. It's not a straight line or even a smooth curve. There are fits and starts, there are ups and downs, there are uh, progresses and regresses, and it doesn't happen all at once. And I'll get to what I mean by that in, a, in just a little bit here. There are a matrix of influences. There's no one thing that really propels the scientific revolution. Uh, yes, having more wealth absolutely helps. Yes, having kingly patrons absolutely helps. Yes, having access to knowledge from the classical world and from the Renaissance does help, or having uh, the ability to read multiple books that are relatively inexpensive, uh, thanks to the, to the printing revolution, uh, is absolutely important. But no one of those is the whole, uh, the, 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 the entirety of the genesis of the intellectual revolutions of, of the scientific and enlightenment revolutions it's a matrix it's several different things so what do i mean so so why europe well well first uh we have an increase in wealth uh we have this increase in literacy we have exchanging of ideas from the chinese and the indians and the ottoman empire uh you also have these absolutist kind of an upside of absolutist control lots of times when we talk about absolutism students will go well i hate that i don't like the idea of somebody being 100 percent in charge well it's not always a bad thing uh there are some silver linings the absolutist monarchs uh particularly in france in order to display their power would often uh charter libraries or they sponsored uh uh, scientists or they became the object of satire later on so it's uh, in a way their their absolutist control on power opened them up for a dialogue about what is the nature of power who should be in charge why should they be in charge that sort of thing and so along with this increased wealth along with this increased uh power of kings we also have increased literacy and i haven't talked about it at all uh, because of reasons, uh, but the printing press is the media revolution that kicks it all off. Prior to the printing press being um, really popularized by Johann Gutenberg, uh, it kind of had existed before, but really didn't meet the technological level that it needed to be useful until Johann, uh, until Gutenberg. Um, and then, of course, his invention is kind of copied here and there, and it leads to this massive proliferation of books. Prices of books become cheaper. Books become more reliable, more readable, more accessible. This spurs literacy and with the increased wealth with the increased opportunities with increased 
what we will call a middle class, although technically not a middle class yet, uh, with an increased middle class who has some extra free time, you have this spread and proliferation of ideas that really did not exist before. So you have a lot of idle time. So there's a lot of more, a lot more chance for discovery. Uh, there's a lot more chance for uh, discussion about these ideas, and this kind of like uh, gentleman scholar kind of begins to really emerge. Somebody who's not directly tied to the power structure, but still benefits from having a very high standard of living uh, in general particularly in this period of time, the more wealthy you were, the more likely you were to be very well educated. That's just the way it is. So let's talk about the, that empirical and rational model first. Um, so it's important to look at the upsides and the drawbacks of each of these. So the empirical model, uh, empirical, uh, perhaps best embodied by Francis Bacon, uh, a, a profoundly important uh, intellectual inquirer into the underlying realities of the universe. He believed that, that the way to get to truth is not to speculate. Take your ego, take your preconceived notions out of it and gather samples. Gather samples and compare and contrast them. Uh, is this equal to that? If not, why not? Experiment on them. Perform tests upon them. Perform the same tests on each one of them. For example, if you want to test the flammability of an object, uh, perhaps you gather as many objects as you can find in your world and you apply flame to them. It has to be the exact same temperature of flame, has to be the exact same size for the exact same duration, and you replicate over and over again. How long does it take a brick to set on fire? Okay, well, bricks seem to never set on fire. I've left this here for three days. It's very hot, but it's not on fire. So we can say, okay, probably not very flammable. Okay, well, I've got this pack of papers that weigh the exact same amount of, uh, of as a brick. Let's apply flame to those. Oh my God, everything's on fire, that sort of thing. So replicating these experiments, the same experiment should yield the same results regardless of where you test it, who does the testing, when they do the testing. So for instance, if, if uh, a experiment only works at midnight on the third Friday of any month, it's probably not uh, the, the conclusion that you're drawing is probably not based on reality. It's based on something else that's happening. Now, there is some issue with this, um, with uh, the empirical model. The empirical model doesn't allow for extrapolation. It doesn't necessarily allow for imagination. Uh, it doesn't allow for uh, the possibility that your senses that you think everything is okay. Say for instance, you gather several pieces of rock uh, and you think, oh, well, these are all the same rocks. Little did you know, one of those rocks actually has radium in it and it's slowly giving you cancer. You can't see the radiation coming off of that rock. You don't know why you're getting cancer. So maybe the empirical model would be, okay, rocks in general just give you cancer, right? So there's an issue with that. Now, on the opposite end of that is we have Rene Descartes, who is actually more known as a philosopher, but he was he considered himself what we what he called a natural scientist. Uh, he believed that it was important to order your mind first. Your mind needed to be disciplined. Your senses deceive your mind. Uh, so the things you hear the things you smell, the things you see, the things you taste, the things you touch, whatever. The things that you sense can deceive you. You need to eliminate uh, any kind of illusions that you've had, eliminate all these preconceptions, all these prejudices that you have, and approach a topic from a purely rational sense. He took this to the extreme. He had this whole theory uh, we'll call it a brain in a jar. How do we know that we are really human beings living on this planet and not just the product of some strange, deluded demon's 
dream or uh, that we're not some brain in a jar being tormented. Well, he peeled back. How do I know I am me? How do I know I am a rational human being? How do I know I truly exist? And the only thing that he could come up with, the only rational reason that he could come up with to prove that he was alive is that he was asking the question, am I alive? And therefore, by thinking, am I alive? He is proving, yes, I am alive. It sounds somewhat circular, but it's really, you can't prove that you're not in a dream. In your dreams, maybe you have false memories. In your dreams, maybe you have false sensations. In your dreams, maybe you have false relationships and see faces that you think are familiar in your dreams, but when you wake up, you're like, I never knew that person. I don't know who that is. Uh, same thing is true with Rene Descartes when he says, uh, when we walk through the world, we may be deluding ourselves. So we strip away. We cannot prove. I cannot prove that you on the under, other end of this video exists. I can't prove that a cat exists. I can't prove that the sun exists. This may all be a weird deluded dream, but the fact that I'm asking myself, is this a dream? should be enough to prove that I am a rational human being who is capable of independent thought. And it's summed up in cogito ergo sum. I think, therefore, I am. Now, Rene Descartes did a little bit more than just those esoteric inquiries. He also began to use mathematics to try to prove underlying truths, and that if you can find the underlying truth of a mathematical formula, for let's say the perfect chocolate chip cookie well then mathematically that's replicable across the universe doesn't matter where you are as long as all these conditions are met uh, you can also think about the mathematical models that are capable of proving the trajectory of of comets or of the uh, way that human beings will react we just maybe find the easier ones first and we just have to keep working at them now there's a problem with Rene Descartes' uh, approach, and you may have already sensed it before, is that how do you know you're being rational? And how do you know that maybe your rational thought experiments aren't leading you down an incorrect uh, path? How do you know you're not deluding yourself without any kind of empirical evidence to prove that there is indeed a mathematical model that proves how to make the perfect chocolate chip cookie uh, how do you test that? How do you test that it's the perfect chocolate chip cookie? Well, you need replicability. You need empirical data. So there is a little bit of, of like symbiosis there, but also antagonism between the empirical and rational models. Now, a good example of how the empirical and rational models kind of collide are kind of reinforce each other to push against traditional views of the world is a view of the heavenly bodies of astronomy now uh all the way through to about the 15th century there was this belief in europe that uh, in the aristotelian model of the universe Ar aristotle was a fourth century greek philosopher who believed that the earth was in the center of the universe and that everything rotated around the earth in these perfect crystalline spheres almost like a, a clock if you will it is a model that is called geocentric in other words the earth is the center of the universe now this happens to align with judeo-christian teachings uh, it essentially reinforces what is written in the bible now the bible is not a scientific text it is not absolutely 100 percent uh, scientifically provable uh, but because we have this Aristotelian view, this philosopher view that was derived from independently of the Bible, it was a very popularized and uh, um, theory of how the universe is created, and it really uh, remained unquestioned. Uh, not that it was popular per se, it was just kind of like a, well, of course, that's the way it really is. Well, the Bible says so and Aristotle says so, therefore, we have two sources that say, yes, that's the way it works. 
But the problem with these is they're based on observations, just pure observation of the universe without any kind of testing, no real mathematical inquiry. Now, there are some societies, for example, the Egyptians, who said, eh, not really, maybe, maybe that's not really the way the universe works, but they don't get as much traction in Europe as uh, the Aristotelian model did. Along comes Nikolai Copernicus. Nikolai Copernicus quietly propounds his idea of heliocentrism. Heliocentrism is that the sun is at the center of our solar system, not the universe, the solar system, just this one particular chunk of the universe. And then he does propound this very quietly. He publishes shortly before his death. Uh, he keeps the crystalline spheres, keeps these perfect circles. Um, and so is able to mathematically more accurately predict the path and uh, idiosyncrasies of the planets in the nighttime sky. Now, it's not a perfect idea, especially because Copernicus keeps this idea of a sphere, uh, an immobile sphere of stars that are kind of not really other celestial bodies. They're just points of light that somehow were suspended in some kind of a, a, a little globe, still keeping a lot of these crystalline spheres that are from the Aristotelian view. Galileo Galilei comes along a little bit later and rather loudly proclaims this idea of heliocentrism, uh, and he improves upon Copernicus's model. The moons and other celestial bodies orbit around other planets, not just the sun and not just the Earth. So there are moons around Jupiter, for example. Why do they orbit Jupiter? Well, Jupiter has more moons. Shouldn't Jupiter be more important in God's eye? Well, then that that whole geocentric, early heliocentric model begins to fall apart. Uh, he used mathematics and he invents a uh, early telescope to be able to observe the moon and proves that the moon is not a perfectly spherical object, that it has craters in it. Uh, he is persecuted for his ideas. Later on, a man named Johann Kepler, uh, who studies Copernicus and Galileo Galilei, comes up with a more, um, a more accurate model, mathematically accurate model. Uh, and he also still says heliocentrism, the sun is the center, and that he further improves upon these by mathematically in, uh, uh, proving that the paths of the planets are on kind of an elliptical track. In other words, not perfect circle, but like egg shaped, uh, and that they uh, wobble and bobble within that path so they're not perfectly aligned. They're not acting as a perfect machine. They are uh, influenced by other bodies, uh, particularly other planets. Uh, Jupiter, for example, has a profound effect on the, the path of comets and the path of uh, other celestial bodies. So if uh, Jupiter is in a position where when Mars passes r relatively close to it, it makes Mars wobble a little bit because Jupiter's pulling a little bit of a little bit of Mars towards it, even though it's more pulled by the sun. So he explains even better these wobbles and imperfections. And Kepler is able to do this largely because of some schisms that have happened within Europe. There's an increase uh, in kingly authority in Europe. So there's that absolutism. Uh, and there's an increased independence thanks to a, a more vibrant trade and a less, uh, less stifled uh, economy. So let me ask you this. We've, we're talking about history. So why in God's green earth am I talking about astrophysics? Why is understanding how the universe really structured important, especially to human history? And especially, uh, it doesn't seem to matter. You're talking about things that I'm sure that I'll, that'll be covered in a science class. Why is it important for human beings historically and even today to understand how the universe is really structured? And, and what methods 
did astronomers use to determine the truth? What did Galileo and Copernicus and Kepler use to determine what is the true nature of our solar system? So what does this tell us about educated Europeans and, and have their views of the universe changed? And how does, how does this affect other fields of inquiries? If we can take something that is rock solid, that for hundreds of years had been unquestioned as absolute truth, both biblically and philosophically, and suddenly we go, mm, maybe it's not. What does this imply for other fields of inquiry? Well, a good example would be for gravity. Galileo Galilei comes back into our conversation, and although he is more of a Renaissance figure, his uh, work in not just astronomy, but also in physics, lays the groundwork for a uh, scientific for the scientific revolution. Now, the old idea was, and this seems to be kind of the method that most people approach the world. They think about heavy objects and they think about light objects and they think about them falling. So for example, if you have a 10 pound cannonball and a one pound cannonball and you drop it off of a very tall structure, which should reach the earth first? In most people's minds, they think, oh, well, the 10 pound object is much heavier. It's harder for me to lift. Therefore, gravity is pulling more upon that object than the one pound object. And so therefore, the 10 pound object should fall faster. Therefore, gravity is relative. Gravity is selective. Gravity decides somehow that one thing should be pulled more than another. This leads to a very, um, a very mercurial universe, one that you cannot rely upon to have a fundamental, immovable, implacable truth. The new idea propounded by Galileo Galilei is that gravity is uniform. Gravity pulls all objects at the same rate, regardless of weight. And he did this by dropping those aforementioned cannonballs off of a tower, uh, the Leaning Tower of Pisa in this illustration. And they fall and they land at the same time. Unappreciable difference. Though there's other factors at play when objects fall. For example, if you were to drop a 10 pound cannonball and a feather, well, the feather has a lot more surface area it's more uh it finds more resistance in the atmosphere than maybe the cannonball does uh it it there's a lot more at play when you drop a feather versus drop a cannonball so there's a lot at play uh but he's saying essentially that gravity in and of itself is uniform therefore there is a universal structure to calculating gravity and that becomes uh, Sir Isaac Newton, in the middle of the scientific revolution, devises a way to explain physics, explain gravity in a way that is easily replicable, not just on Earth, but also in other celestial bodies. There is a constant. And he comes up with these, these models of physics and these models of gravity that are universal. It doesn't matter where you are in, not just on the planet, but on another planet, on Mars, on the moon, on Titan, on Pluto, doesn't matter. These models of gravity will uh, be easily calculable and can be expected. Uh, you can find out the universal truth. Uh, this also leads to his models of physics. Newtonian models have been adjusted since then, and some of these are not as relevant as they were when first propounded by Sir Isaac Newton, but they do form the basis of further inquiry. So the theory is there, the evidence may be imperfect. So as evidence becomes more perfect, theory may alter or it may reinforce the theory. Now the first law of Newtonian physics is that an object at rest will stay at rest and an object in motion will stay in motion unless acted upon by an external force. And I want you to think about that 10 pound cannonball. That 10 pound cannonball will stay on that ground 
until somebody picks it up. If it's on flat ground, absolutely flat ground, it's not going to roll. It's not going to shift, not going to change, unless something pushes on it, whether it's a strong wind, uh, maybe a bird lands on it and gets it rolling. Uh, maybe there's a tilt or uh, a shift in the surface that makes it roll downhill or an earthquake will make it move. Those are external forces that make the object move. Otherwise, it will stay motionless. Same thing with the objects in motion. In space, in microgravity in space, if you fire an object, in a direction. Let's say um, you are an astronaut and there was an accident and you are thrown from your uh, vehicle and you're moving at a relatively sedate pace of a thousand miles an hour. You will continue to move a thousand miles an hour forever until something else acts upon you. That may be you hit a planetary gravity well and get pulled into the planet and burn up an atmosphere or slam into the planet who knows maybe it's a moon right or maybe uh you use your jetpack and give yourself a push in the opposite direction and now you're hurtling back towards your vehicle you will continue to move no matter what until something else acts upon you now in on the earth there are no uh, there are no perfect vacuums and even space isn't a perfect vacuum but in a perfect vacuum an object will continue to move if you had a hundred mile long tube of vacuum and you know shot a, a bullet in that vacuum that that bullet will keep going as long as gravity is not affecting it as long as air resistance isn't affecting it humidity uh, heat rising from the ground as long as all of that isn't affected, that bullet will continue moving. He also had this, this uh, idea of how uh, force can be calculated. How, uh, well, first off, force is essentially a form of energy. And energy, that energy can be um, calculated by uh, the mass times the acceleration. So force equals mass times acceleration. The more mass or the more acceleration you have, the more force is imparted. That's why uh, if a truck hits you at 10 miles an hour, it's going to hurt a lot less than if it hits you at 100 miles an hour, right? Uh, for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. This in, in, is very evident if anybody's ever fired a weapon, uh, a firearm, as it were. Uh, you get recoil. That tiny little bullet, itty bitty little bullet, probably about the size of the tip of your finger, maybe uh firing downrange is going to push against your shoulder it's going to be absorbed by these springs and by other mechanisms to kind of uh, dissipate that energy that's a lot of energy because that bullet is moving at supersonic speeds it is moving faster than the speed of sound therefore it has acceleration even though it has a teeny tiny little bitty mass that force is going to move in two directions forward and backwards and this whole concept of, of uh, how the real world works is, is profound. It is a, an amazing revelation that allows other scientific uh, advancements to continue. Another good example would be in medicine. Uh, but the old ways, they die hard. Um, Johannes Kepler, for all of his uh, all of his intellectual prowess, uh, he remained a court astrologer. Uh, in other words, he told the fortunes of the uh, of the kings and queens. Uh, he was personally influenced by astrology. He wouldn't do certain things on certain days because he believed that you know heavenly bodies had an influence on his on his uh, um, life. And so there was this kind of like mysticism involved in his his personal views, even though mathematically he was proving that these these bodies work rationally um, to the rational person today. Your fate is not written in the stars. Your fate is crafted here on your on Earth in your own hands.
Isaac Newton, although uh, a profoundly important scientist in his own right, was also an alchemist and a magician. And he tried transmogrification of elements, uh, particularly turning base metals into gold and uh, and constantly tried to break into that, quote unquote, pseudoscience of, of alchemy. And now we move on to the Enlightenment. The Enlightenment is uh, a parallel or a brother, if it were, of the scientific revolution and, and, and begins in the 16th century and lasts well into the 18th century. And much like the scientific revolution has the same kind of tensions, the old versus the new. Uh, in this case, conservatism, in other words, preserving the old way of life versus liberalism or this new expanding way of looking at human interactions. Again, it's much like the scientific revolution. There are fits and starts. It's not all at once. And there are matrices of influences. In the in the case of the of the intellectual revolution of the enlightenment uh there's a scientific approach to physical world that can be used as a quasi basis for inquiry into the way that humans interact with each other and so there's this very interesting way of like saying well how can we be more efficient how can we be better uh science a, a better scientifically engineered uh social machine but there's also bigger questions that can be tackled. Things like income and political inequality. The old model used to be that, well, this was just inherited. God wanted you to be born poor, therefore you live poor. That's the way God wanted you to. Um, the king is born rich and powerful or the queen is born rich and powerful. That's the way God planned it. Uh, the intellectual revolution begins to question that and say, well, is that absolutely true? There are we have evidence of people who are relatively lowborn becoming extremely powerful, uh, becoming extremely wealthy. What, what happened with that? And what about the rich people, the the powerful aristocrats who become impoverished or who who go insane? Uh, so therefore, is income and political political inequality is that inherent or is it imposed by our society? Racial relations as well. Racism uh, becomes a huge uh, um, arena of inquiry for the intellectual revolution in the 18th century, and it carries on into the 19th century. And also this idea of, of increasing the rights of people as they increase their wealth and increase their influence upon society. And the old model, it was that the, uh, the aristocracy had the power. Uh, everybody who was not aristocracy did not have power. But what happens when a middle class merchant, somebody who worked their way up or maybe inherited a little bit of wealth and became more powerful? Uh, what happens when that middle class merchant has more money and has a better lifestyle and has more affluence than the aristocracy? Shouldn't that affluent middle class person have more say in the direction of the government or the direction of their country or the direction of their society. So where do laws come from? I want you to think about that. Do laws just spring into being? And even more, why? Why do laws exist? Why have laws at all and and to whom do laws apply in order to be laws to whom should they apply now in absolutism the king determines the laws the power to determine the level of rights resides with the king so if the king says you're my buddy these laws don't really apply to you or he says i don't know you you're a mere peasant all the laws apply to you so essentially power prevents laws effects the more powerful you are the more immune to laws you are and blood or birth matters so it's inherently unfair it's inherently un unequal and the only thing that matters your is your birth it doesn't matter if you are ingenious it doesn't matter if you're charismatic it doesn't matter if you're intelligent or wise or or even affluent, doesn't matter. You weren't born into the right family. Therefore, you don't have 
the share of power that these other people who, by luck of the draw, are born into powerful families. Well, there is a critique of absolutism, and that, unsurprisingly, uh, can be found in England. And John Locke uh, is a one of those affluent gentleman scholars. Uh, he, lucky enough to be born into a relatively tolerant society where he has some mobility, some social mobility, uh, and he propounds that rights are not determined by birth, that if we are to believe that all people are God's children, therefore God would imbue all of his children with certain inalienable rights. Inalienable means they cannot be taken away from you or alienated from you. The ability of any one person is not determined by birth. There are idiots, morons who think that they're, they're geniuses who are born into wealthy families who are just lucky. They became rich because their family was rich, but they're not extra special. And yet at the same time, there are people who work really, really hard, who are constantly working multiple jobs, who are, who are striving to educate themselves, who are making themselves better. They have more drive, they have more ambition than any inherited wealth may impart onto somebody. In at the core of that is John Locke's belief that we are all born a blank slate. We are not predisposed to greatness. We are not predisposed to slovenliness or to abject hopelessness. We are born a tabula rasa, the blank slate, upon which our fates may be written by ourselves. And furthermore, he said that it's completely natural for you to act in a rational manner to defend your life. In other words, if somebody's trying to kill you, it is rational for you to stop that person from killing you or to kill them before they kill you. It's also equally rational for you to resist being taken prisoner, to fight for your liberty, your freedom of movement, your freedom of existence. And then, of course, your property is yours. It is not a king's. You are not beholden to a king. In the medieval model and to a lesser degree in uh, the early modern model, if a king determined that your horse, your house, your entire bank account uh, was not yours, he or she, that, that sovereign, could, in theory, take it away from you. Now, not likely to happen in England, but it could happen. Definitely likely to happen in Russia or in France, where the king could say, nope, your castle is now my castle. Your uh, lumber mill is now my lumber mill, and I take it away and don't give you any proper recompense. It's okay for you to defend yourself, to defend your property, to say, no, I earned this property with my blood, sweat, and tears, with my uh, ambition, with my drive, with my labor. Therefore, I'm going to defend it. And if the king shows up, I'm going to, you know, shoot the king. Or if the king's representatives come up, I'm going to fight them. Let me ask another set of questions. Is it okay to prevent people from worshiping? But even more importantly, but what if they believe in a God that you don't particularly believe in? L let's say they call it by a different name. But what if, what if you really, really, really don't like their interpretations of religion? Wouldn't it be better if society just believed everything exactly the same religiously? Wouldn't that be just so much easier and so much better for society? Well, Europeans struggle with this idea as well during the Enlightenment. Um, religious purity and religious puritanism is nothing new. Uh, you see that on whether it's yard signs or uh, billboards or state legislatures that believe, oh, well, uh, doing X is a sin in the Bible. That's what my interpre 
interpretation says. Therefore, I'm going to make this illegal for everybody because we need to have religious conformity. Uh, and conformity in this puritanical view in the 16th century, this is Oliver Cromwell we're looking at here, uh, is that conformity is loyalty and the loyal conform. That's essentially what it means. Laws should be made reflecting one particular interpretation of religious doctrine. There's only room for one religious truth. There's only room for one religious interpretation. And you must persecute those who do not comply. And this happens time and again in European history. The Thirty Years' War, uh, the Schmalkaldic War, the Huguenot per Persecution, and even the Salem Witch Trials. People who do not conform are therefore of the devil and must be killed, tortured, beaten, destroyed, exiled, whatever. Well, this kind of um, intolerance, much like absolutism's intolerance of inequality, of social inequality, this intolerance, this puritanical intolerance of religious inequality or religious disparity uh, elicits similar critiques. Uh, a good example would be Voltaire, uh, Francois-Marie Arouet, uh, a French philosopher who argued for the separation of church and state, that religious oppression stifles society, that by imposing what one thinks of as an absolute religious truth is to essentially doom a society to stagnation, degradation, and disintegration. Faith differences at the heart of it, he argues, are nons nonsensical. You are taking uh, the word of a book written hundreds if not thousands of years ago without inquiry without uh, rationalization, without saying, mm, does this really fit my life? A good example would be uh, the prescription against homosexuality that is present in Leviticus. If we are to take this prescription uh, as a true, deep, and unfathomable uh, abomination and a sin in the eyes of God, we must therefore assume that the other prescriptions in Leviticus also apply. So everybody who has ever eaten shrimp or shellfish or lobster or crab, uh, you have committed an abomination in the eyes of God. You are an abomination. It's an inexcusable sin, especially if you keep eating those endless shrimp at Red Lobster. Or if you've ever worn a cotton polyester blend or a cotton linen blend or any kind of mixed fabric, if you have um, a puffy jacket that's made of nylon with down inside of it, if you have fur lined leather gloves, you have two different materials and that is also an abomination in the eyes of God. And so to Voltaire, faith blinds the person. Faith makes the person um, intolerant. And that reason, thinking things through, if this equals that, then what does this imply? Thinking it through, reason allows the person to see. And Francois Maria Wett, uh, under the pen name Voltaire, writes a series of critiques and satires. He critiques kings, he critiques religion, he even critiques common people. Nobody is spared his acerbic wit. Um, and just to give you an idea of how would this affect you in your daily life, uh, Francois, Francois Marie Arouet and Benjamin Franklin were actually very good friends and they, they were pen pals together. And so Benjamin Franklin being one of the founding fathers uh, does have an influence on the direction that American uh, government and American politics takes, especially in the early years. Let me ask you another more profound question, maybe perhaps something a little bit more personal. How do people make money? And is it okay for a few privileged people to make all or even most of the money? How do you measure 
a nation's prosperity? Is it in raw dollars or raw pounds or raw yen or raw euros that are generated? Do the masters of business conspire with each other against everybody else? Well, in the late medieval and early modern period, there is a system that kind of exists in most European societies, especially most European countries that have overseas colonies, and it's called mercantilism. And essentially at its heart, although there is no perfect example of this, at its heart, the state controls the rights to trade. So the king or the parliament or whatever gives you permission to engage in overseas trade in exchange for a cut of profits. Now, this right to trade is called a monopoly, which is typically given to a single company, hence mono, mono, one, poly, all right? So the monopoly is a single company is allowed to trade for that product money comes back to the state, the state is increasingly wealthy. Works out well, but it's a closed system. In order to have a monopoly, you cannot have competition either internal or external. So in order to discourage people from buying uh, products from other countries that may be cheaper and may impinge upon that monopoly, there are tariffs that are imposed, uh, taxes, very steep taxes, or even straight laws that are that ban the trade in, say, Spanish products or uh, Portuguese products or German products or whatever. So these these tariffs are intended to prevent the people living within a society from purchasing things from outside the society. This can lead to some certain black market uh, endeavors like smuggling uh, and uh, the illegal transportation and sale of goods that are forbidden. Absolutely. Uh, it could be something as innocuous as the trade in cinnamon. Again, I'm going to use cinnamon. Uh, the trade in cinnamon, maybe that's barred in certain countries, but you really like cinnamon in your on your waffles or in your in your applesauce or whatever uh, and so maybe you'll buy cinnamon illicitly or it could be as uh as not innocuous as arms as weapons um drugs uh, uh explosives or maybe certain types of music or certain types of of literature at the heart of it all, however, is this is an artificial imposed system. This is a method, another method of control of that human endeavor towards commerce. Humans have for thousands of years taken it upon themselves to trade with one another, whether internally, locally, or even along long distances, such as the Silk Road. Commerce is not mercantilism. Mercantilism is an attempt to control commerce. Into this milieu of commerce, into this milieu of, of mercantilism and the control of commerce, comes Adam Smith, a Scottish economic philosopher. And he's critical of monopolistic trade. He's critical of monarchies and the aristocracy being able to control this. He argues for an expansion of the ability of people to enter into the natural exchange of goods and services that is known as commerce. He advocates for a new system, again, an artificially imposed system called capitalism. According to Smith's original manuscript in 1776, small and medium-sized businesses are optimal. Large businesses, however, essentially lead to a new kind of neo-mercantilism, a new kind of uh, artificial control and a stymieing of economic growth. Now, these small and medium-sized businesses would foster competition between employers. This would increase wages, it would increase quality of product, it would increase efficiency, it would increase profitability, and it would offer opportunities for more people to get into uh, the lucrative trades 
uh, for instance, tea or uh, cocoa or tobacco or or even or even slavery, unfortunately. Uh, Adam Smith, it's interesting to note, opined that capitalism would be the dearth of slavery. Um, not exactly true, it turned out, because uh, capitalism, as it was cherry-picked by certain people and as it continues to be cherry-picked by certain people, uh, capitalism relies upon the exploitation of workers, uh, lower wages, lower health benefits, uh, lower rights within the workplace, that sort of thing. Uh, but that's actually an abuse or a, a perversion of Adam Smith's, um, Adam Smith's uh, arguments. He propounded this idea that every person should be deeply educated in how economies work and exactly how they can continue to foster an open and free trade through medium and mid-sized businesses and that he was critical of ignorance and ignorance that would be imposed by monopolies or imposed by large companies uh, and that an educated consumer would spend wisely they would know who to trust, who not to trust. They would know if they're getting ripped off. They would know if they would be, uh, if they would, if they were getting a good deal. Uh, so knowledge is power. Uh, this is also true for workers. He advocated for uh, workers to be educated about how much the average worker gets paid. So this whole idea of don't tell you know, don't discuss your wages with other uh, workers uh, is a method of control by the employer to keep everybody ignorant. Because if you know you're getting paid, say, five dollars less an hour than the guy who does the exact same job with the exact same qualifications, you might get angry. You might move somewhere else, but they don't want to lose you because you're productive, that sort of thing. So he was very critical of ignorance, both imposed ignorance and self-imposed ignorance. It is, however, at its heart, just an idea. This is a political or an economic, in this case, idea of how the world should work. And we do not need to be beholden to uh, an idea just because it uses the word capitalism or just because it uses the word uh, free market. It is important in Adam Smith's uh, treatise that he outlines the need for constantly revising this, that this human system, this economic system is not static. It is not the orbit of a planet. It is something that needs to be adjusted and refined. And again, that's where his criti uh, critique of ignorance comes through. So, uh, old ways do die hard. Now, Adam Smith, uh, for all of his work, he is critiqued for the heartlessness of the uh, capitalist economic system. At the heart of his argument, it is that profit drives good. You know, so profit is good. Greed is good. Uh, and so many rightfully critique him as being heartless. Well, what about the um the debt or the obligation that business owners owe to their society not to exploit not to pollute not to uh to be harsh masters smith's works were later corrupted uh in the years efforts to excuse religious uh ethnic bigotry economic resource exploitation uh and all sorts of abuses uh, the natural rights of man, uh, the the John Locke uh, conservative reaction was that uh, John Locke is proposing something that is is horrifically radical. That how can it possibly be that somebody born to a peasant is equal in rights and privileges and uh, and um, ability to somebody who's noble born? Natural rights are not so natural when they were issue, applied to the issue of slavery and genocide. And this was a, a issue that is taken up and struggled with in the forming of the United States. Um, John Locke had this, this concept of life, liberty, and the, and the acquisition of property that was kind of borrowed wholesale and slightly tweaked by Thomas Jefferson, who said that 
every human being, all people are endowed with their creators with certain inalienable rights that amongst those are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Well, is that true that all men are created equal? Then why, Thomas Jefferson, do you have slaves? And he even wrote that slavery would be the bane of his time and that it would eventually undermine the young nation that he sought to craft. So are natural rights natural when they don't apply to everybody? What about religious tolerance? Uh, is the right of any religion over the needs of a society? What if that what if that religion is a cult uh, that advocates poisoning people or murdering people? Is it is it okay for them to be tolerated? Do they need to be put in jail? If we put them in jail, are we persecuting them? Are we persecuting a religion just because they believe differently and they believe in a different system? Religious Bigotry seems to be baked in, uh, doesn't it? I mean, kind of part and parcel of, of any given society that has a majority religious point of view. So how do you overcome that? Do you just give up on religions completely? Do we follow Jean-Marie Arouet's example and make fun of all religion and believe in nothing, even though for some people religion offers a boon and a balm upon them? Is that fair to take that away from them? So in conclusion, uh, there's a, a, a huge mix of influences that create the opportunity to understand the world and people better in Europe. Now, old ways do die hard and the prophets of change, whether they're Adam Smith or, or uh, Isaac Newton, they're, they're not perfect. They're human. They're just like you and I. Europeans can learn the wrong lessons from these universals, uh, from these uh, revolutions rather, and that these universal laws seem to only apply to Europeans. And then on top of it, to only certain Europeans. And it's a long, hard struggle towards freedom, towards the expansion of rights, towards the toleration of other religions. And a lot of these, uh, a lot of these changes occur in the face of new politics and a wider world in a more connected world and that human society is constantly trying to catch up to the new innovations to the new world we find ourselves around a good example would be laws governing what can and cannot be said um, or what can and cannot be advertised on the internet. Can you advertise a cure for autism that is, comes in a pill? Uh, can you advocate uh, the idea that the world is flat? Um, can you advocate that, you know, that certain people shouldn't exist? Is that freedom of speech? Is that, uh, is that a mere expression of an opinion as unpopular as it may be? Are you free to exper ex express that opinion? If so, who gets to say? Who is in charge of you saying that opinion and, and what kind of reaction there should be? So human mechanisms are always trying to play catch up to new changes in the world around us. And the Enlightenment and the scientific revolution are no different.